Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. Today's patient is a Commodore PET model 4032 computer. The model number means that it's a 40 column 32K memory machine. I got this from the same seller who sold me the Atari 1050 drives covered in a previous episode and also the Commodore 128 uh, collection also covered in a previous episode which I urgently urge you to watch. You might learn something. I sure did. But anyway, on this one no promises were made. When I asked the guy what it did, uh, he said that it powers up but uh, it's garbage on the screen. And uh, actually he told me that on the phone and uh, what that usually means is since, since this has a CRT controller in it kind of like the TRS-80, that means the CRT controller is running but there's a problem with the CPU. CPU is not coming up or is unable to uh, clear the screen or put stuff into it. Now this is very interesting to me because I have never programmed or owned or even laid hands on a Commodore PET. None of them. This one, the chiclet keyboard style, none of these. So this was especially important or interesting to me. Of course the downside is I've never seen the inside of one of them, I've never worked on one of them, and I don't even know how it's supposed to behave when you're hitting that power switch and things don't happen properly. I don't know what to expect. So uh, there's quite a bit of reading I've done on it. And uh, anyway, I, I went uh, to get it. And uh, what I saw was a little bit different than the description I got. I of course assumed the guy had tried it before I went there. And he was telling me about the garbage on the screen and all of that. And I went there and it was sitting in front of his garage on a on a bunch of plastic crates precariously balanced there and he immediately ran to turn it on and uh, since we were on the outside there was traffic noise I couldn't hear anything and I sure as hell couldn't see anything appear on the screen so he power cycled it a few times nothing happened looked surprised and uh, then said but look it makes a noise I couldn't hear anything so when I uh, came close to this and the power was turned on, you could hear some sort of a chirp coming out of it. But uh, the screen wouldn't come on. So uh, anyway, it looked like a really interesting candidate for repair. I made the deal. And, uh, and here it is. And let's see if we can get this guy to, to, to do anything. Obviously, uh, the seller had power cycled this several times already, so I'm not going to bother with the uh, Variac on it. Let's just turn it on and see what we can hear. Power switch, where are you? Did you hear that little phone ringing noise it made? Anyway, that's what it does. The screen doesn't do anything at all. I can't feel any high voltage on here. I can't hear any uh, horizontal frequency scanning. Nothing at all. Let's do this again. In case you didn't hear it loud and clear the last time. Here we go. So something's happening in here. I mean, the processor's doing that. It wouldn't be... I'm pretty sure it doesn't have a hardwired circuit to make it chirp like that. But now we come to the point where we need to figure out, okay, wh where do we start? Do we start the usual, look at the processor, is it getting reset, does it have a clock, are the voltages good, all of that good stuff. But uh, he did say that it showed garbage on the screen at one point in time. So maybe all that's wrong is that the screen blew something blew up something and uh, well I thought it would start with the screen. The back cover comes off pretty easily 
and reveals the chassis and the tube here. And uh, first glance, everything looked fine. No blackened uh, components on the circuit. One of the thing I did was uh, I uh, I powered it up. Still couldn't hear anything, or there didn't seem to be any high voltage. However, the uh, neck lit up. Now, what that means is that uh, now really all that means is that the neck is getting the heater voltage. And the glow you see in the neck is just the heater lighting up. So it's getting voltage from the uh, main unit through this connector here. But uh, the absence of high voltage in the most common cases usually says that there's something wrong with the horizontal output transistor over here. Because if this doesn't oscillate or isn't driven by an oscillator, it will not generate the high voltage through the flyback. So my first suspicion was this transistor over here. And uh, to make a long story short, this transistor is good. Nothing wrong with it. So let's have a look at, uh, at the schematics and see what else we could check out in here. The schematics for the 4032 are available. Actually, it's a service manual, but uh, it's a little bit sparse on verbal information. It gives you full schematics, board layouts, and also waveforms uh, for the monitor. But uh, there's no theory of operation or troubleshooting uh, uh, charts or anything like that. But I shouldn't complain. Better than nothing. So here we have it. We have the uh, horizontal drive or horizontal sync vertical drive and sync, and the actual video signal coming in. And uh, down here is the power supply. It gets, uh, what is it, something like close to 30 volts AC coming in here. It runs through an 18 volt regulator, and that's the main voltage supplied to the rest of the circuit over here. I did test the, the output of the regulator for both voltage and ripple and everything looks good. I'm getting very close to 18 volts with little ripple coming in. But then I started testing waveforms, comparing them to what was uh, given in the waveform charts and voltages as uh, listed on the schematic. And uh, pretty much uh, the uh, voltage, the 18 volts main supply is the only thing I get that's working. Everything else is pretty much non-functional. I embarked upon a uh, long test of the circuit. I pulled out the uh, chassis and I started to uh, test components. Obviously first transistors, uh, diodes. I, ch I tried to check continuity in the, uh, in the flyback. Not try, I did check continuity. It seemed okay. All the transistors checked good checked the uh, capacitors, they were good, at which point I jumped over and started to actually check resistors. I did most of this in circuit, only if something was uh, looked suspicious, I pulled them out of circuit and uh, <clears throat> tested them that way, and uh, nothing. Everything looked fine, Just everything looked just great. After doing this for a couple of hours, finally I looked at the schematics and uh, uh, because I also noticed that the horizontal oscillator wasn't working. It's supposed to be uh, driving the uh, horizontal output transistor with a sine wave over here with the horizontal frequency, which is probably around, what, 15.5K or something like that. And it wasn't happening. There wasn't anything coming in here. And that's when I finally realized that unlike other monitors I have worked on, this is not an amp this is not an oscillator over here. This is an amplifier. And that's when it all came to me is that this is labeled horizontal drive, not horizontal sync. On uh, other monitors you generally have an oscillator that's free running over here and has a limited range. You, you can change the frequency slightly by hard locking it to the incoming sync sync signal. 
it's a limited uh, range, but uh, that's generally the way they work, and that's why you can turn up the brightness with other monitors without anything connected, and you will see the uh, you will see the uh, retrace lines on it when it's really bright. Well, this one won't even light up because there is no high voltage, and the high voltage is generally or usually generated through the horizontal output transistor. But if that isn't being fed by a sinusoidal signal, then you don't get anything and nothing works. So, I should have paid heed to the labeling here. It says horizontal drive, not horizontal sync. So what this means is it expects a, well, a waveform to come in over here to drive this whole thing. It doesn't oscillate on its own, and that's why with nothing connected to it, there's no high voltage, there's no, you can't turn up the brightness, you can't see anything, because this is entirely driven from the external source. Same thing for the uh, vertical drive, not vertical sync, but vertical drive, and then on top of that, of course, you have the uh, the video signal itself coming in, and that's fine. If nothing's connected, you won't see anything other than the retrace lines. But that, of course, uh, told me where I was going wrong, that testing this monitor without anything connected to it isn't going to yield much, much of a result. So what I had to do was, okay, let's eliminate this as a problem spot, or mark it as a problem spot, but let's hook up something to it, and, uh, well, obviously when it's hooked up to the uh, PET, what's coming in here isn't good enough. It's not making it light up. So let's find something to drive this with and see if at least we can get the screen to light up. Here's what I'm going to use as my video signal generator. It's my 8088 P Turbo PC that uh, we brought back to life in a previous uh, episode. And... Uh, I think it still works, at least I hope so. And what I've done is uh, I've connected directly to the monitor connector with this uh, professional connection scheme. And I went through the uh, breakout box I built, which is essentially a CGA to VGA converter breakout box. Uh, it's a barrier strip that you can just connect signals to. and. Uh, if we get something, it's probably not going to be pretty, but this is just a proof of concept to see does the monitor light up at all or not. So, uh, well, first let's see if our test rig lights up. And look at that. It is showing something on the screen really ugly but yeah the monitor is lighting up it is accepting signals I think the uh, horizontal and vertical drive signals are probably a little bit out of range for the monitor that's why things are folding over but it's displaying something the monitor is alive and I mean it's not total garbage it's mostly fold over and the screen height is off but, uh, yeah, that's what the original looks like, and uh, that's what the uh, Commodore looks like. So I think this is a proof that the monitor is actually functional, to a certain degree, and that the fault lies with the motherboard in the PET. So, back to the workbench. Back on the bench. So let's see what video, if any, the PET's outputting. And in order to do that, so if you remove two screws from under here and here, it kind of folds open like a, like a hood or a truck cab, giving us access to the interior. It has a convenient prop rod right here and is properly balanced. Quick look at the inside. Uh, here's everything. Transformer, smoothing capacitor for the 5 volts, 
and uh, regulators and everything is on board here. One of the things that's going to make things a little bit more complicated or difficult is that pretty much everything on here is not socketed. The DRAM, the uh, all of the, the processor, everything over here, and even worse than that, the ROMs. Only one ROM is factory socketed, all of the others are soldered in. These are non-standard, well they're 20, let's see, 2332s, 2632 ROMs, which are basically 4K by 8 ROMs. But they soldered them in. They're pretty, uh, pretty uh, confident that these work. The boot ROM is this one over here, which is soldered in. The kernel, as they call it in Commodore parlance, kernel with an A at the uh, uh, at the next to last letter because somebody misspelled kernel early on and they just stuck with it and you'll see kernel misspelled with that next to last letter being an A in a lot of the Commodore documentation because they just kind of stuck to it. This is what's called the editor ROM and that is socketed and then the others are the basic ROMs. But more on that later. Right now over here is a connector that goes to the uh, monitor and that carries video, horizontal and vertical drive and ground of course. So let's have a look on the scope and see what we're getting out of those. Alright, so uh, here's the uh, monitor connector which I've pulled out from over here, which you can barely see. But uh, the pinout says that pin 7 on here is ground and pin 5 is the uh, horizontal drive. So I hook it up, we get a drive. If we look on the scope, what are we getting? We are getting frequency as five point, about 6 kilohertz. That, that number doesn't seem right. I would expect it to be 15.8 or something like that, but after I looked through the manual, there's actually a trace from, uh, from inside the, the monitor and the, the, the signal's inverted. This is the horizontal drive that's supposed to come in, but uh, if we check the uh, time and uh, voltage divisions, this is telling us that we're looking for a 20 kHz sync signal. Well, we're only getting 6. And that's just odd because it's not even an even, can't even, you can't evenly divide it, divide 20 by something to get 6. So it's some really weird frequency that's coming out of here. And that's probably the source of our problem. Now, to continue, just for grins, the uh, having looked at those displays, uh, at those uh, waveform uh, plots, the uh, vertical sync is supposed to be 60 hertz. And uh, and you know what? There's nothing coming out of it. absolutely nothing. So uh, horizontal is off by more than a factor of three. Vertical is uh, dead. And finally video. Well there's something happening with video. We don't, you know, video is kind of hard to read on a scope screen. But, you know, that's a little bit too even. That's probably putting up blocks or garbage. But, you know, since the horizontal frequency is too low, but well, both the horizontal and the vertical is too low, the monitor doesn't light up anyway, so it isn't lit up right now. And that's where we're at. So, now we've got to put on our thinking caps and go, why are we getting the wrong sync signals? 
The next culprit was the uh, video chip. The video driver, which is supposed to handle everything, it's actually generating the uh, H drive, V drive signals. And uh, of course, this was uh, socketed. It's a 6545, not a very common chip. You can find them here and there. But uh, from what I read was that these things go bad. The difference being that when they go bad, they don't output anything. This is outputting a horizontal frequency, a horizontal drive, albeit the wrong one, but it's outputting something. So, since it was soldered in, I did invest a bit of time and a lot of patience into unsoldering it, putting a socket in, and then what I did was, I didn't have a replacement for the 6545, but I did have a 6845, which supposedly is uh, compatible with the PET. I put that into the socket and I get the exact same result. I got a horizontal frequency that was wrong, same one this uh, generated, no vertical frequency, and that was that. So. Well, it's not the chip. I put this chip back in and just tested it again, did a sanity check, and it acted exactly like the replacement chip I had put in. So this chip isn't the problem. Well, at least I got a socket here now, so if it goes, uh, I can replace it. It wasn't fun doing this because uh, I, I, I tried to be really careful. I mean, if I was just replacing it, I would have cut all the pins off and be done with it, but... Uh, I knew that I didn't have another one of exactly this chip, so I wanted to save it, and save it I did, but yeah, it did take some time. So that wasn't the problem. I checked support circuitry and, uh, you know, all the select signals and uh, the, the signals driving this. The clock was good. There was activity on all the select signals, except there was one, one of the chip selects wasn't getting hit properly. So my guess was that this comes up in some default configuration, uh, which is what we observed on the scope, and uh, it's not getting initialized properly. So what that means is that either some of the select circuitry or driving circuitry for this is wrong, or the processor isn't running correctly. I then did all of the processor checks, clock, reset signal, activity on lines, and that all looked good. I mean, I didn't put a logic analyzer on it, so I don't know exactly what was happening, but uh, it was, uh, it seemed to be running. Here are the, uh, the uh, mask ROMs, five of them, <clears throat> and as mentioned before, only the second one, occupying address space E0 through EFFF, is socketed, and that's called the editor ROM. This is the kernel ROM. This is where the uh, 6502 boots from. This occupies F000 through the end of memory. And the only thing I could find, again, there was activity on all the signals, except only this, uh, only this ROM and this ROM were getting, had activity on the select lines. The basic ROMs, which are these three, were never getting selected, neither on power up nor any time during operation. Uh, one hint, hint I read about was, uh, why don't you just hold down a key, and what happens is if the key buffer overflows, it chirps. So you can either hammer on a key or do like a print character something, but I guess it auto-repeats, so the easiest was to just hold down a space bar or anything else for a while and see if you got a chirp, and I didn't. Uh, nothing happened. I very quickly checked the keyboard interface connector over here, and things kind of looked strange over there. <clears throat> so uh, I checked around a little bit, kind of got ahead of myself, but uh, it was a decoder chip over here that basically drives the columns or rows. Uh, through the PIA, and then reads back what's coming back. There's pull-ups for it, so generally the keys uh, return a high. Uh, but if a key is pressed, it gets shorted to ground, and then that is registered as a valid key press. And the signals just didn't look too good. The, uh, the this chip that was driving the uh, driving the keyboard matrix, 
there were strange waveforms that weren't really extending down the ground. And so I diverted and I replaced. I pulled this chip out, socketed it, and put a new one in. The waveforms now looked a lot better, but I wasn't getting any key presses. I mean, I wasn't. I was checking the return lines. There weren't any key presses coming back. So, well, I, I'll fix something and I'll. Uh, probably benefit from it later, but it didn't change anything. Uh, I couldn't, you know, holding down a key didn't do anything because obviously there were no key presses coming in. So now I had a big decision to make. Something was wrong, either in the ROMs or in RAM. It's got 32K of uh, 4116 dynamic RAMs. Are the ROMs good? I could get images. I can get images for the ROMs, but they're soldered in. And just for grins, since this one was uh, socketed, I pulled it out. And uh, my EEPROM programmer doesn't read these particular ones. But uh, what I did was I built a little converter plug, or socket, that rerouted the uh, pins that were not the same as the 2732 pull this chip out, put it in here, and put it in the EEPROM reader, and it read the chip fine. I read it several times, I kept doing checksums on it, and one, one easy way to find if a ROM is bad is A, the obvious, it returns all FFs, or the second one is, is when you're continually doing checksums on the ROM, on the device under test, if there's something wrong with it, the checksum will change. But this one, the checksum was solid, and uh, it compared to the buffer checksum when I had read it in, and this chip looked fine. Okay, so fine. So, so this chip was fine, but now I had to go in and get these guys out. But uh, it seemed to me that uh, the boot ROM, which is this, seemed to be running, because both of these were getting selected. And uh, the second thing that could be wrong is the RAM itself. And uh, the DRAMs, as I mentioned, as you can see back here, all in a row, 16 of them, all firmly soldered into place. I mean, they go bad. I've seen them go bad in the TRS-80. The 4116s weren't the most robust, des robust design. They are the uh, three supply voltage kinds, plus 5, minus 5, and plus 12. And uh, they are known to fail and they are known to fail pretty regularly. So the decision was, do I remove the ROMs and check them, or do I remove the RAMs? And after doing a coin toss, I decided on the RAMs. And that was, uh, wasn't going to be a very painless project, just like the ROMs, but hey, I had to desolder parts in order to see what was going on here. With both the soldering and desoldering irons heated up, I went along my merry way. And this kind of gives it away already, but uh, I started. I was going to like pull random RAMs, and you know, if you look at it, uh, statistically you have a better chance of finding a bad, bad RAM and all of that, but in the end I said to hell with it, I'll just start from the very beginning and work my way on. And, you know, pull these guys. The first uh, two went well. It did take a long time because I was very careful not to destroy the artwork, not to destroy traces and stuff. And what I did with them was I uh, took out the chip. Again, I didn't want to cut them out because I wanted to know. I needed to know if one of these chips I pulled was bad. I used my trusty DRAM tester which is uh, my parts TRS-80 Model 3. Uh, has no uh, no disk drives or anything in it. All you do is you pull, it has 4116s. You pull one of the 4116s out of the Model 3 in the first bank of RAM, and uh, you put the unit, the test one, in there. And the way it runs is it'll either boot up, telling you that the chip you just put in is good, or it'll show garbage on the screen which will tell you that the chip's bad. It's very reliable, hasn't failed me yet. So, you know, I went through chip one, chip two, 
Chip 3 had a little hiccup here because I actually ripped the trace off and it was messy because when I ripped the trace off it was kind of like lying all over the place and touching other things and I had to do some microsurgery on it and of course not forget to jumper this later on. But this one was good too. And then lo and behold I got this one out. Got it out cleanly, put it in the uh, Model 3 and the Model 3 showed garbage on the screen. I actually repeated it three times, but yeah, it was garbage on the screen. So I had found a bad RAM. All right, let's put a known good one in here and see if we advance any further. So what remains is to pull the bad chip and uh, I just powered on the system, made sure that it's still chirped, but uh, and it does. One of the weird things, not weird, but when you desolder these guys, I mean they cut the pins really close to the board, so you end up with some really short pins, which don't really work well in a socket. I mean these three, I don't even know if these three work correctly in these sockets because they have the same short pins, but they did fit into the uh, sockets on the uh, Model 3. And so, well, we know this is bad, and it is marked as such. And I usually mark them underneath because if you put a piece of tape on top and mark them, then you got to rip off the tape to see what kind of chip it is. And uh, it may end up unmarked, and you may use it in some future endeavor. So I make sure this way that I know this thing's bad. Why don't I just throw it away? I always like to keep bad chips around for sanity checks. But what I do is I go to my stash get out a replacement, I tested a known good one, we'll put that in making sure that it's aligned correctly, I mean do not plug these in upside down or wrong because they will fry immediately and probably take a bunch of other stuff along with them, yes, notches on top were good and let's not forget to plug in the display cable, and off we go to test the whole thing, see if anything's changed. All right, here goes nothing. Warm up, warm up, warm up, oh, there you go. <laughs> that was it. Well, that was it. I don't know what, what else may be wrong here, but uh, there you go. Now, the uh, picture is too small, the height, it's too bright. I mean, the only control accessible from the outside is the general brightness control, which is kind of hard to turn, but turn it down all the way we get this but uh, let's take the back off the back cover off again because there's some more controls inside and see if we can get a better picture all right let's start messing with the controls well obviously the picture is not high enough so there is a height adjustment here And if we turn up the brightness, we can see the picture. So it's still too wide. And I guess for that we have to go into the horizontal width adjustment with a non-metallic tool. Where is it? Wrong direction. Yeah, see, I can adjust it, but the left edge is, so if I keep adjusting it, now there's got to be something to center the picture here. And uh, what else do we have? Vertical linearity. wonder what that is. 
It's a dirty pot, that's what it is. Hmm. Okay, and other than that, I don't think there's any other adjustments in here. So the monitor may need some work after all, but we have something called the sub brightness here. So let's see, let's turn the uh, normal brightness knob to the middle, wherever that is. It's here. And then turn the sub brightness. Ah, it's pretty good. So we have the largest adjustment range with the only accessible knob from the back. And uh, I guess that's as far as we can get with it now. Let's power cycle it and see. Okay, so that looks a lot better. Now, what I haven't done is tried the keyboard because it doesn't work. And that's going to be our next part. So I did play. The keyboard's kind of loose. Oh, something worked. See, some keys do work. The return key works when you press it on the left side. But the other keys don't work. And... So there is some life in the key, uh, some live life in the keyboards, but uh, we've got a problem because that's not not very good life. So let's see. So if we turn up, let's see what is our picture supposed to look like. Well, we got a readable picture now. We now need a uh, working keyboard. And for that, we shall end this episode here, because I'm sick and tired of dealing with this. I spent way too much time on this uh, already, so uh, I need a break and go fix something else. But for now, thanks for watching. Thumbs up would be appreciated. Make sure to, su sure to subscribe so you see the next episode where we will hopefully fix the keyboard in this. And uh, leave me a comment. Tell me what you think of all of this. And uh, we'll see you soon. I just noticed that... Uh, Oh, bonus, bonus footage. I just noticed that I left out a really important diagnostic step, and that is uh, checking the power supply inside the PET. And the way to do that is it has three voltages, plus, plus 5 volts DC, minus 5 volts DC, and 12 volts DC. And the easiest place to check it is on one of the uh, DRAMs, Get yourself a data sheet. Your grounds over here, minus 5, 12, and plus 5. And measure them at the chip. And that will be the actual board voltage delivered. And the voltages should be pretty close. Measure the ripple, which should probably be less than about 200 millivolts. I mean, usually when you measure it, uh, It'll show about two or three hundred millivolts, but you should see it uh, go down rapidly, depending on your meter's resistance. But you do need to do this check before doing anything else uh, with the motherboard.